British Columbia is dealing with disaster. More than a month of rain in just a few hours, triggering flooding, landslides, mass evacuations, highways washed out, and in some places it is still raining. Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, from here in Vancouver to the BC interior, complete coverage of this relentless storm. I'm so scared. From the urgent rescues underway to help hundreds trapped in their cars. Uh, the mud is thick, it's deep, it was moving fast. To an entire city inundated, thousands forced out, the damage extensive. Houses are underwater, We've got cars gone. What's driving this extreme weather on the West Coast? And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Also tonight, home sales are hot across the country again. I think that what we are seeing now is the largest uh, transfer of wealth in Canadian history. Why new records mask old news for would-be buyers left out in the cold. And the politics of a new federal provincial child care deal. This agreement means bringing a 3.8 billion tax dollars paid by Albertans to Ottawa back to Albertans. Plus, Jason Kenney's new leadership challenge. This is The National. And welcome to the special edition of The National. People in many parts of BC are dealing with a deluge tonight. A weekend of record-breaking rain led to flooding and landslides. It shut down multiple highways, trapping motorists and forcing mass evacuations. Wind gusts are making a bad situation worse, as is unreliable cell service. I'm, I'm devastated. I have never once seen anything this bad in Merritt. And tonight we'll take you to the city of Merritt, where thousands of residents have been ordered out after flooding shut down the wastewater system and to Agassiz, where all-day rescuers have been working to get hundreds of stranded people off a busy highway. They are two focal points right now, but weather is wreaking havoc all over southern BC. This is just a snapshot of how widespread flood watches and warnings and evacuation alerts and orders were today. Some places have received a month's worth of rain or more in just two days. One of the most dramatic scenes played out today on Highway 7. That's along the northern bank of the Fraser River between Hope and Agassiz. Two landslides stranded nearly 300 people overnight. Susanna De Silva is near the slides, and Susie rescuers spent all day trying to get them out. Where do things stand tonight? Well, Ian, some of the dramatic aerial rescue efforts of the day have now stopped. Of course, it is dark, but they worked right until that last little sliver of daylight to work to get through people out. They were able to bring about 300 people to this reception center here where they are processed. Some of them are staying. Some of them were able to go home or find friends and family to come and pick them up. But we are told there are still more people stranded on that highway on the other side of one of the slides. They're hoping to clear another slide to get those people out and get them towards hope. But for tonight, those efforts continue and about 60 people now are hunkering down for the night here at this reception center after a very difficult day. I didn't know what we were going to go through. I, to be honest, I thought I thought more rocks were going to fall off. The trip home from a relaxing winter vacation soon turned into a harrowing nightmare for Corey Lizoherka and his family. First, forced to turn off one highway, being overtaken by rushing water, only to get trapped on another between two slides. I thought more the more the hill was going to fall, and you could see the waterfalls coming. And I, you know, I thought, is this kind of it? Like, you know, it sounds cliche, but I really thought, is this the day I'm done? <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it was pitch black and they were out of options. There was really nowhere you could go. And even if you did go somewhere, like what it says just down 100 meters down the road, yeah, that area is not going to collapse on you too. They were among around 275 people forced to spend the night in their vehicles as rescuers focused on about a dozen people trapped in the torrent of debris. They were still very liquid, moving and full of huge chunks of debris like trees and rocks. I think there was like three or four cars that had gotten pulled in and there were people yelling for help last night and it was it was really hard to sleep because car alarms were going off that got sucked into the river and I was just super worried about the people that were getting rescued down there. Officials don't yet know if there are other vehicles trapped in the debris. Crews battled brutal weather conditions, sending a steady stream of helicopters in to bring people out 20 at a time in order of need. Medically, 
Uh, they seem fine. We had one report of someone who uh, was insulin dependent, uh, didn't have their medication, but part of our team are BC Ambulance members and they were able to get that person medication quickly and take care of it. Uh, but you know what, probably traumatized and not that comfortable after a long cold night in their vehicles. And that number included about 50 children. But while people waited to be rescued, a community formed. Paul Diol even set up a Facebook group to help everyone share food and other supplies. Everybody's just helping everybody else out. And the help continued after their rescue. Everyone was brought to a reception centre in Agassiz, where volunteers and donations arrived all day. It's just been heartwarming. You know, the, like all the food that's there, you got it, it was super warm, everybody took care of you. And, and I asked, hey, how can I help? They're like, oh, we got tons of volunteers. And I, can I donate some, some money? And they're like, we got enough of it. So hats off to this community of Agassiz. And Susie, there have been other landslides in the province as well. There have been. There was another one near Lillooet that also left some drivers stranded. There were about 50 people had to be rescued in that case. And of course, work will continue tomorrow when daylight begins once again as they will assess the damage to the roads, but also ensuring that anyone who is still trapped obviously can still be rescued, but also ensuring that anyone is may not be still unaccounted for, ensuring that everybody uh, did make it out from these slides. Okay, Ian. All right, Susanna, thank you very much. And coming up later, we'll hear from one of those people that Susie spoke to who was airlifted to safety, what it was like when he and his family realized that they were spending the night stuck on the side of the highway. That's in about 20 minutes. The major weather system has also led to the evacuation of an entire city in the B.C. interior. Thousands were forced to flee Merritt after flooding damaged hundreds of homes and caused the complete failure of the municipality's wastewater treatment plant. Brady Strachan shows us the devastation. I can see my shed and my white fence. I can see the top of my house. This morning, Diana Boston waded through floodwaters to get her family and pets to safety. I was frozen already. I was like, I was on the verge of ice, like hyperventilating or whatever you call it, like getting too cold and I couldn't barely even function. A large chunk of the city is underwater after the nearby Coldwater River spilled its banks and poured onto properties. Inside, I'm tearing apart. Um, on the outside, I have to stay strong. Like I said, I have my daughter and my pets, and you know they can feel when they're getting sad or upset or agitated. The city's water treatment plant is flooded. That has forced the evacuation of the entire community, more than 7,000 people. Emergency officials are telling them to go to the cities of Kamloops and Kelowna. My heart goes out to people. I know we've had people um, come here to City Hall to ask if they can please go uh, and collect a few things from their homes, and we've had to tell them it is simply not safe. This is the big yeah. school bus over here. Um, yeah. Do you want to try and get onto it? Or? Yeah, be awesome. yeah, okay. Alex Watson and his partner Jessica DeWitt watched as water streamed into their kitchen early this morning. Heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. Because you can't do anything about it. Nope. Nothing. At least with the fires, we kind of had a chance. You could come out with the, the hose and try to... That was to... only three months ago, like... Yeah. And to this extreme, and our house is half gone. This one's Aries. This one is Sophia. They were able to get their five cats and some belongings out before water got too high in their home. They are among the thousands, getting out of town as fast as they can, not knowing what will be left when they are allowed to return. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Merritt. Unprecedented flooding has also hit the town of Princeton about an hour south of Merritt. The Tulamine River is said to have breached the dikes at about midnight last night, and that led to the evacuation of hundreds of homes. Later in the hour, I'll speak to the town's mayor, who says at least half of the downtown core has been severely flooded. The rain has also caused major damage on one of the province's most important highways. It happened near the Othello Tunnels on the Coquihalla Highway, one of the main connectors between the Lower Mainland and the rest of Canada. Video shows an entire section of the highway gone after being washed into the river below. No word yet on the total extent of the damage, but as you can see, it'll likely be a while before this part of the highway is able to reopen. And that was one of just several highways closed today in the region, making it practically impossible to travel out of the lower mainland by road, where weather also played a major role today. Renee Filipponi joins us now with the latest on the impact here along the south coast. 
Well, Ian, the rain has let up in a big part of the Fraser Valley, but there are still some major concerns when it comes to the safety, specifically about those increasing river levels. Hundreds of people in that region have been evacuated, and this evening they have had to close Highway 1 through Abbotsford because water has breached the highway. Police are working to remove any cars that have been stranded, but are warning people, don't go there, don't go to that area. There are no good alternate routes. Stay home. On top of that, residents are also being told by the regional district to conserve water, only use it for essential reasons. No laundry tonight because of the extra pressure the floodwaters are putting on the sewer system. It's been a stressful 24 hours for many in Abbotsford as water poured over their streets and for some into their homes. James Reinhaller says without the help of firefighters, things could have been a lot worse for him. Um, they pulled a whole bunch of sandbags in the back and completely saved our house. We're very grateful. We had a little bit of flooding in some lower parts of our house and in our carriage uh, house in the back. Some of his neighbors weren't so lucky. Everything in there is completely soaked. There is um, thick layers of mud in all the crawl spaces, all the garages, everything's bashed in. Things got so bad, police were warning people to stay home. You are putting yourself at risk by driving down there. You are trapped in your vehicle. Your electronics might stop. Your windows might not open. The province says it's unclear how widespread the damage is or what it will cost. The situation is dynamic and further rains, high winds and possible snow in areas are compounding the situation. The province has been in continual contact with local governments and we're working to support those affected. Vancouver Island was also hit by this enormous storm, washing out a number of roads, including parts of the Malahat Highway, even flooding a hospital. Well, there's stuff blowing off this roof too. And in Vancouver, oh, wow. once the rain stopped, oh God, it was wind blinders. creating issues, blowing furniture off patios and pushing a massive barge towards Vancouver's popular Stanley Park seawall, which was closed this afternoon because of high winds. And communications, Renee, also a problem. We were going to do part of the show from the Fraser Valley, but we didn't have enough cell phone uh, connection. And of course, we weren't the only ones facing that. That was a problem right across the region and, and difficult for us to do our job. But imagine how challenging that was for people who were trying to connect with loved ones they were worried about or crews and officials trying to communicate with the recovery efforts. Now, we did hear from Bell and Rogers, who said this was due to multiple cuts in the fiber line due to the weather conditions and that they were working to resolve it as quickly as possible. Ian? All right, Renee, thank you very much. The federal government says it's ready to provide help to those affected by the flooding. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau addressing British Columbians on Twitter today, saying he's, quote, ready to provide whatever assistance is needed as you deal with and recover from the flooding and this extreme weather. Let's get the expert view on what's happened here in British Columbia with Environment Canada meteorologist Bobby Seiko. So from your perspective, what happened this weekend? Yeah, we had a pretty potent atmospheric river come through, and we've seen a few of these already this fall, but this one was particularly strong, bringing that warm tropical air all the way up from Hawaii and delivering heavy amounts of rain and melting snow to BC. Yeah, so melting snow, that's interesting. You know, the, I, I guess that, that added to the flow into the rivers. That's right. We had some early season snow up in the mountains, and with this warm push of air, those freezing levels rose above mountaintops. So we saw rain all the way up to the mountaintops, and that all contributed to the, the moisture. And we had so much rain for such a long period of time, even before the weekend. I assume ground was saturated in a lot of parts of, of the lower mainland. Yeah, really, we've been dealing with uh, wet weather since September. September, October, both above average in terms of precipitation. And of course, November is our normally our mo wettest month of the year. And so really, uh, lots of moisture in those soils. Sometimes we use the word unprecedented too often, but this was record setting, uh, record setting pre precipitation. Absolutely. You know, over the last two days, places like Hope got 252 millimeters of precipitation. And yesterday, they set an all-time daily record of 174 millimeters of precipitation. These are high numbers, very wet. Yeah, if you picture a ruler, you know, 12-inch ruler, there's almost that much of water that dumped down there. Bobby Seiko, thank you very much. And we're going to keep watching the developments here in BC. But as you know, Adrian, this is on the heels of an already difficult year of extreme fires and heat waves. So what else can we expect? Bobby will be back with us later in the program.
Alrighty, and what a mess. There is another weather system that's wreaking havoc, this time in Alberta. We were in that side, we were in this line. As you can see, driving has been treacherous along Alberta's Highway 93 that's in the Banff area. It's been like that since Sunday when heavy snow caused long pileups. Some drivers forced to spend the night in their vehicles. Some killed time making snowmen. Most of the blockage has been cleared now, but some drivers report that normally short trips home dragged on for some 14 hours. Now, Alberta has signaled, has signed on to the federal government's child care plan, leaving just two provinces which haven't. David Cochran has the details. It's often hard for Justin Trudeau to find a friendly crowd in Alberta, where even on a day when the prime minister shows up with billions for child care, they're sniping. This agreement means bringing a 3.8 billion tax dollars paid by Albertans to Ottawa back to Albertans. The provinces and the federal government don't always get along on everything. An understatement when it comes to this government and this province. Negotiations were held up because Kenny wanted a childcare deal similar to what Quebec got, with big money and no strings. I think the basic aspiration of Albertans is to be treated equally, to have the same uh, powers uh, that Quebec func exercises. If Alberta already had pro child care at eight dollars a day across the province we would have had an approach similar to Quebec. The Alberta agreement leaves just two provinces without deals New Brunswick and Ontario. Why is he so unwilling to cut a deal for ten dollar a day child care for Ontario families? We want a deal we've been at the table for months. The issue, says Ontario, is the federal offer isn't good enough. It doesn't give credit for provincial investments already made in full-day kindergarten, and the money only lasts five years. So we do not see a program that is viable for five years and then declines in year six. But federal officials insist Ontario hasn't put anything specific in writing, and that lack of detail is getting in the way. The federal government is there with the money and the framework to do it, and we're very hopeful that Ontario will do it. Some federal liberals also believe the Ford government is posturing in advance of next year's provincial election. Their hope is that with Alberta now finding common ground, the pressure will grow on Ontario to cut a deal. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Premier Kenny was also asked about a challenge to his leadership today. A key number of constituency associations passed a motion demanding a leadership review before March the 1st. In terms of uh, that or other motions, that's up to uh, the UCP board, the party board, to deal with those matters, and uh, I'm sure they'll do so in the appropriate way. A leadership review was already scheduled for April. As to tensions in his party, Kenny pointed to the pandemic. I can understand why so many folks have felt uh, frustrated by uh, the public health measures that we've had to introduce at various times to protect our health care system here in Alberta. And those frustrations are being felt in my own party and caucus. There's no secret about that. The United Conservative Party's annual general meeting kicks off this Friday. And the federal conservative leader, Aaron O'Toole, is facing a fresh challenge to his leadership, launched by this senator, Denise Batters. In announcing a petition to members, Batters says O'Toole has been inconsistent on issues dividing the party. She has 90 days to gather enough signatures to force a vote on O'Toole's leadership. Climate summits like COP26 in Glasgow may involve compromise, but across the globe, climate change does not. Take Kenya, that's a country torn by extremes. Two million Kenyans in the north face starvation thanks to drought in the south. Rains and floods wash away homes and sometimes lives. Margaret Evans is there with stories of those taking action right now. Say hello to climate change in the Nairobi slum. Volunteers knee-deep in the thick sludge and waste that clogs drainage troughs when it rains, sending water elsewhere. Those toiling are part of a project called Weather Village. They translate weather forecasts into local dialects and text them out. Clearing drains seemed the logical next step. 
Flooding has become more common, solid ground harder to find. People used to die because especially this area that you're standing, the water levels sometimes reaches up to somewhere here. It's the kind of local initiative Kenyan activists say would benefit from the climate change funding the developed world keeps on promising but fails to deliver. Climate change activists who went to the UN summit in Glasgow came back disheartened. It is not a favor to Africa. It is what we need as the, collectively as the global community. <laughs> Many here ask why Kenya should abandon fossil fuels that might help pull people out of poverty when developed nations responsible for much of global warming are slow to do the same. Comfort. For the generation that will have to live tomorrow with today's decisions, it's scary. It's not just flooding, but drought too. These students say the West, including Canada, has a moral obligation to do more for countries already experiencing climate change. We are the lowest emitters, and what we are now seeing has been with us for quite some time. But that shouldn't encourage Kenyans to give up, says this engineering student. I'd appeal for us as young people generally to start looking for smaller strategies um, and to just make ourselves engineers. A little bit like the weather warriors back in Kibera, perhaps, at the end of their labor for now. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Nairobi. Here in BC, extreme weather and our changing planet, top of mind tonight for so many. All the stone has come down. Coming up, what to make of this round of extreme weather and what else we can expect, plus. We return to the dramatic scenes from Highway 7 and speak to a man who spent the night stuck before being plucked off the road by rescuers. And I'll be back with housing prices, which are skyrocketing again. But they did tell me, yes, our parents are going to give us the down payment. But the head start that some are getting could be forcing others out. We're back in two. That is a look at the White House, where tonight Joe Biden and Xi Jinping are meeting for the first time as presidents, not in person. It's a virtual meeting, but it's a start. The relationship between the two superpowers has been deteriorating. What happens next matters. So Washington correspondent Susan Ormiston is here. Susan, can you walk us through what's on the agenda? As you said, U.S.-China relations are tense, each eyeing the other warily, with Biden concerned about China's nuclear buildup, military aggression around Taiwan, treatment of dissidents, and the economic clash between the two superpowers. Tonight, though, President Xi started off saying the two countries should coexist peacefully and that he's ready to move relations in a positive direction. Good to see you, Mr. President. Although it's not as good as a face-to-face -face meeting, I'm very happy to see my old friend. President Xi hasn't left China since the pandemic, so the meeting tonight, morning in Beijing, is still virtual. President Biden has said one overriding diplomatic objective is to avoid a misunderstanding, which could end up in a full-blown conflict. Our responsibility as leaders of China and the United States to ensure that the competition between our countries does not veer into conflict, whether intended or unintended. President Xi will be pressing on trade. He wants the U.S. to end tariffs on $350 billion worth of Chinese goods put in place by President Trump. But Washington has already telegraphed that those tariffs won't be retired yet. Xi also wants the U.S. to back off intervening on human rights and China's military maneuvers. Biden has been rallying Asian Pacific allies with Xi telling his country the East is rising, the West is falling, and that there is an unprecedented window of opportunity for China to catch up, Adrian. So, Susan, realistically, what can be expected out of the summit? Well, modest expectations tonight. No red lines, no joint communique, but in three hours, some substantive diplomacy. Biden will raise China's treatment of both the Uyghurs and Hong Kong dissidents, also China's recent test of a hypersonic weapon. This summit really is about exercising power, but keeping those channels open. In spite of the collegial tone which kicked off tonight, these two leaders, Adrian, are far apart. All right, thank you, Susan. That is Susan Ormiston in Washington tonight. Former Donald Trump aide Steve Bannon surrendered to the FBI this morning. I'm telling you right now, 
This is going to be the misdemeanor from hell. So he is facing criminal charges for refusing to give Congress information related to the January siege on Capitol Hill. Bannon previously argued he was using the executive privilege given to him by the former president. He is scheduled to be formally arraigned on Thursday. The police have now confirmed that this is being treated as a terrorist attack. It is a stark reminder of the need for us all to remain utterly vigilant. And so Britain raised its national threat level to severe as police investigate Sunday's deadly car explosion outside Liverpool Women's Hospital. And today police named the suspect as 32-year-old Imad Aswamin. He died after the driver of the taxi he was in discovered his explosive device and locked him inside the vehicle. Four other men have also been arrested. I was arrested and held in captivity for no reason. That was American journalist Danny Fenster. He's free now after U.S. officials negotiated his release from six months in a Myanmar prison. Fenster was among the more than 100 journalists and media workers arrested after a military coup in February. All right, so let's head back to Vancouver. More special coverage of the B.C. storm. Any? Adrian, we're going to hear from two people right in the middle of this disaster. Let's take a look at some video by Paul Deal. He and his family were trapped in their truck overnight. What those hours were like and the moment they were airlifted to safety. And houses are underwater. We've got cars gone. That is the mayor of Princeton, B.C. earlier today. The water moved in fast, faster than he or really anyone expected. How things are looking tonight. Next. Welcome back as we follow the destructive weather hitting BC. If you're just joining us now, a quick recap. I'm so scared because we are just next to the river. Car alarms were going off that got sucked into the river. And I was just super worried about the people that were getting rescued down there. And authorities still trying to determine if anyone was swept away in the landslides. But rescuers did reach nearly 300 people near Agassiz, east of Vancouver, who, was trapped, who were trapped overnight and airlifted out about a two hour drive northeast in Merritt, this. You can't run your taps, you can't flush your toilet. You just, it's not a livable situation. It's bad enough that we are evacuating the entire city. Flooding overwhelmed the community's water supply. All of its roughly 7,000 residents have been ordered to leave. Not far away in Princeton, a levee broke, forcing the evacuation of another 200 homes. And states of emergency have been declared in several parts of British Columbia, including in Nanaimo, in the Fraser Valley, in the Lower Mainland as well. Paul Deal is one of those 275 people who spent the night in his car with his family on Highway 7, trapped between two mudslides, but uh, he's made it out and he's finally home. Paul, that must feel great to be back home now. Yeah, hot shower never felt so good. So take me back to last night, you and your wife and your two sons, they're just four and six years old. Tell me about that moment where you realize the four of you are going to be spending the night in the dark on the highway. Yeah, it, uh, it happened pretty quickly. We, we were at the home stretch on, on Highway 7. Um, we saw some flashing lights up ahead. We didn't think there was any more landslides because there's nothing being reported. A gentleman came up you know, who was turning cars around telling us, hey, there was a pretty substantial slide and it's likely it wasn't gonna be cleared that night. So we turned the car or truck around and headed back to Hope. We made it maybe a minute down the road before traffic stopped again. And we came to the realization uh, that we were trapped between two slides. And so um, then really it was a matter of uh, finding uh, where's the safest place to park the truck so we don't get caught in another slide that night. I, I bet it was a long, cold night. Uh, describe it for us. I can't imagine being in that truck overnight with two little kids. What was it like? You know what? It, it actually wasn't too bad. Uh, we're pretty fortunate to drive that highway pass quite often. So we always have an emergency kit. My mother-in-law is Italian, so she packed us tons of food to bring home. And so we <laughs> had we had uh, food and drink. We had blankets and candles. So so we were we were okay to spend the night. I think the, the kids were a little bit scared because you know there's a lot of water running off the hill. So once they got calmed down, we fired up the Netflix. They got to watch uh, three movies that night with us. So 
So they had a blast. So it, the night wasn't too bad for us. I think we were one of the fortunate ones. Yeah, you're nothing if not resilient. And as great as that experience sounds like it was, it, it got even better when the helicopter came. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, we figured out, I think, around one o'clock in the uh, in the afternoon that the helicopters were coming. So between the stretch that we were trapped in, there was uh, a lady by the name of Tracy from the Ministry of Highways. She was walking up and down the road. Uh, we had a doctor and a nurse. So we were checking on people. We had a little community set up there. Um, and so I think the biggest thing was just feeding people information. Once we knew that choppers were coming, everybody kind of calmed down and it was, it was all right. And then uh, a big relief. Uh, the first thing they did was that the, the, the commandos or search and rescue guys from the from the choppers went and they checked on everybody, let everybody know that, hey, we're all going to be out here tonight. And then they started loading up families and young people. Yeah, it's four and six. They got to take their first helicopter ride, so they're pretty excited. We have just a few seconds left. You mentioned your kids were a little bit nervous last night. How are they feeling now to be back home after a helicopter ride? Yeah, the, the youngest had a tough go, um, but once we got to the uh, the emergency center in Agassiz, uh, they were pretty excited. The, the you know hats off to everybody um, in that community of Agassiz. There was uh, warm clothes, fresh clothes. They had toys for our kids, so they actually didn't even want to leave the evacuation center because there were so many toys there that we could play with. But uh, you know they're both glad to be. There's been a lot of hardship in British Columbia in the last 24 hours, so it's nice to hear a story with a happy ending. Thanks, Paul. Thank you so much. Another look at the stunning images out of Princeton, B.C., another interior town with house after house underwater. About 200 homes have been evacuated. A nightmare scenario for so many people living there and for the officials as well. And joining us now from the fire hall is the mayor of Princeton, Spencer Coyne. I know you've been busy in your community today and into the evening. Uh, explain for us, describe what it was like in Princeton yesterday and into the evening as the rain just kept falling. Yeah, so yesterday, uh, yesterday was a pretty hectic day. We started the day with uh, Highway 5 and Highway 1 being diverted through our community. Uh, at that time, I was helping direct traffic through the community to keep the traffic flow going. It rained and rained all day. Uh, about two, two o'clock in the afternoon, the river was at uh, the three foot mark. By seven o'clock when I went home, the river had risen up to the 10 foot mark. And uh, by around midnight, uh, it, was, it was already starting to breach at the 12th mark. You know, on nice days, that river is, is so pretty and so gentle as it goes by the city. Have you ever seen it rise as quickly as it did yesterday? I've never seen it rise that quickly, no. Uh, I've talked to a bunch of you know, old timers in town and, and they've all told me the same thing, that they've never seen it rise like that. Are things stabilized now in Princeton? What's next for your, for your community? Uh, things aren't stable. Right now, uh, we have the Tulumin River is rising again. Uh, it it went down earlier in the day, but it's rising up right now. And the Similkameen River is also rising on the other side of town. So right now we're we're uh, trying to shore up our defenses on the Similkameen River, and we're trying to do what we can to keep the the what the damage on the Tulumin side where it is. Uh, tonight's going to be a, another long night. As, a, as the mayor of this community, as a longtime resident of Princeton, how are you feeling tonight? Um, I'm tired. <laughs> uh, we're all tired, um, but we're, we're not giving up. It's our home and uh, we're all fighting for it. All right, well, Mayor, thank you very much for speaking to us on what I know has been a really busy day and we all wish you and your community the best. Thanks again. All of this flooding is just the latest extreme weather that people here in BC have suffered through this year. Wildfires, heat waves, and now floods. We'll talk about our changing planet next. Plus, amid all the chaos today, a barge floating loose in Vancouver's English Bay. We'll hear from someone who watched it all go down. Stay with us. It sounds cliche, but I really thought is this the day I'm done? Some harrowing stories across southern BC tonight after days of heavy rain caused landslides which blocked roads and flooding which tonight has thousands of people out of their homes. 
When many people think of British Columbia, they think of nice weather. But in 2021, one extreme weather event after another hit this province, and the effects have been devastating. We had 159 fans show up today, and they're basically gone. In late June and early July, a heat wave hit. It was relentless and killed nearly 600 people in British Columbia. The town of Lytton broke three straight Canadian heat records, topping 49 degrees Celsius on June 29. Oh my God, look at that. The next day, it was destroyed by fire. The whole village is going. For weeks afterwards, wildfires were the big story here as they pushed into communities and forced people to flee. In October, what meteorologists call a bomb cyclone knocked out power to tens of thousands of homes. Caught in it, a cargo ship which lost dozens of containers before others caught on fire. Then, just over a week ago, a small tornado touched down in Metro Vancouver. The first time that's happened in more than five decades. Well, let's bring in Environment Canada meteorologist Bobby Seiko again. And because of COVID, of course, we're keeping a, a safe distance out, outside. When, when you see that, that list of extreme weather events here in BC this year, as a meteorologist, what comes to mind? Well, certainly it's been an interesting year here in BC from the heat dome over the summer and now this extreme uh, atmospheric river now these are not necessarily intertwined together, but nonetheless, as the climate changes, we can expect more extreme events in the future. And let's talk about that atmospheric river. Uh, we've had those before, the, the sort of, you know, storm systems that are coming here from Hawaii right across the Pacific. It was a little different this time around, though. Absolutely. This is a quite potent uh, atmospheric river. And the way the front set up and where it stalled out, exactly over the Fraser Valley, that's where it concentrated a lot of the rainfall. At, at what point, because we had had warnings maybe 10 days in advance that something big was going to happen in terms of rain. As you were watching the weather patterns, at what point did you realize that we we're looking at something that, that appeared to be unprecedented? Well, certainly we were tracking it just as the same as we track every atmospheric river and the days leading up to it. You know, we got the special weather statement going last Friday and then upgraded to warnings over the weekend when we started to see what kind of uh, punch this could pack. There are a lot of lessons here, and I think one of the lessons is preparedness. You know, I think of people like some of the people we interviewed on the program who all of a sudden had to spend the night at the side of the road on Highway 7. For you, what's the lesson? Yeah, it is really about preparedness and uh, we know that, you know, this time of year is a stormy time of year. We, ha we encourage having emergency kits in your house, but that goes the same for your vehicle as we travel around this time of year. As we're seeing now, sometimes it can quite come in useful. And so having things like flashlights, warm clothing, food, water, crank radios, these things are very important. I'm not asking you for a specific forecast about the weather over the next few weeks, but overall, what should we be expecting? Uh, to, to in the days ahead. Well, we're still in November. November is still the wettest month of the year on average here in uh, the south coast. So, you know, keep an eye on the forecast. We are going to have a couple of dry days into Tuesday and Wednesday, but uh, it's important to keep up with the forecast and the next atmospheric river and see what that's going to be bringing. Well, you're doing a really nice job dealing with the sirens and the people playing music and the gusts of wind. Uh, Bobby Seiko, thank you very much. All right, back to you in Toronto, Adrian. All right, Ian, thanks very much. Next on The National, this country's housing crisis is only heating up. What we are seeing now is the largest uh, transfer of wealth in Canadian history. How families are helping each other but hurting the real estate market. Next. I'm Angela Starrett. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Frontburner. The geopolitical standoff causing a migrant crisis at the Poland-Belarus border and the people desperately trapped in the middle. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. October's numbers are in and experts say they show 2021 is already the busiest year ever for Canada's housing market. But as prices climb, hope and opportunity, well, they drop. The average sale price is now over $700,000. That's up 18% in one month alone, driven in part by panicky buyers competing for fewer homes. Nisha Patel takes us inside the frenzy and how it could be calmed. In Canada's hot housing market, when a for sale sign goes up, 
It's quickly replaced with sold. I would say FOMO is real. The fear of missing out, a driving factor for home buyers, says realtor David Fleming. We're seeing a lot of people saying, well, I need to get in, and they're doing that right now. Prices in markets like Toronto and Vancouver moving further out of reach, more than a million dollars for a detached home. I recently had people that were in their early 40s and they were very sheepish, but they did tell me, yes, our parents are going to give us the down payment. New research from CIBC shows nearly 30% of first-time home buyers are getting help from the bank of mom and dad, an average of $82,000, but significantly more in big cities like Toronto and Vancouver. I think that what we are seeing now is the largest uh, transfer of wealth in Canadian history. Economists say policymakers should take note, as it's making the wealth gap in this country even wider. And to make housing more affordable? So far, we have been dealing with supply issues using demand tools. That will not solve the situation. We need more supply. It's a call to action that's gone on for months. And during the latest federal election, many promises were made. The plans are just band-aids. Uh, they're nowhere near um, the range or, or the scope uh, and scale of housing that we need. Experts say all three levels of government need to look at solutions together to target building hundreds of thousands of housing units a year, to speed up land use approvals, and to act with more urgency. The supply takes time to ramp up. And I think the good decisions uh, made, if made today, would show some um, relief maybe five years down the road. So no quick fixes for a housing market that has been too hot for too long. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. There are so many stories from the extreme weather in British Columbia, including a Vancouver man who spotted something unusual in the water. The moment a loose barge made a break for it. That's next in our moment. Well, that's not something you see every day or maybe any day until now. A barge floating loose in Vancouver's English Bay. So one passerby pulled out his phone, captured the scene, and this particularly wild moment from BC's Extreme Weather Day is our moment. I just went for a walk on my lunch break to the water to see the waves and suddenly there was this gigantic barge. My first thought was this is going to crash on, onto something and it might affect uh, people or infrastructure. It was really, really close to shore. The size of it uh, becomes very impactful. So I was just terrified of what this thing could do. It started floating really fast across English Bay, something you never see. The waves were crazy. Uh, there was an intense amount of wind. So I started running next to the barge to try to catch it and take a video of it, or I didn't even know what to do. And suddenly a lot of people started noticing um, and people started running with me. And then we got to where the barge eventually just luckily hit, uh, I guess, a, a piece of rock or a sandbank uh, by a place called Sunset Beach. This was a very scary taste of uh, what climate change could look like. Adrian, I hadn't seen that video until this moment, but I was driving back from the Fraser Valley today, flipping around different radio stations, and they all were talking about it, and I see why. It was incredible. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, the good news for the Coast Guard, uh, Ian, is that they don't think there's anything hazardous necessarily on board. It's just a matter now of, of getting it back to where it is supposed to be. And I'm curious about something. I know you've lived there a long time. W what strikes you the most about this day? You know, it had been raining for so long in Vancouver and other parts of British Columbia. I sort of had a feeling on Sunday that all that rain, the ground saturated, that something might happen. And then that atmospheric river, as we heard from the meteorologist, got stuck right over the Fraser Valley. And that kind of tipped the balance. That was what made it so bad there. And so a lot of people still trying to deal with that tonight. That is the national for November 15th. For more information about the floods, you can check cbcnews.ca for live up to the minute updates all night. Good night.